And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, I gotta gotta warn you. I gotta warn you. Uh, this podcast. Uh, not only am I being joined by Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls. Chris Pedersen being the director of research uh, with our foundation, and uh, Daryl, the director of analytics. And you're going to see some of their great work today, I think. But also, we're joined by people who are doing some work on the house that I'm in right now. So you may hear a hammer uh, a time or two, uh, but, but more importantly, I think you're going to learn some neat stuff from these guys. And I, I want to give you a heads up. We are recording this uh, on the 6th uh, of uh, September, but it will air, uh, I believe, on the 14th. And the reason that's important is because on the 17th of, uh, of September, I'm going to be making a presentation to uh, uh, the Boston Bogleheads chapter. And I thought some of you might be interested in joining us. We'll have the, the uh, Zoom link in the notes to this uh, podcast. And the reason I think you might be interested is because I'm going to be talking very briefly about the $12 million decisions that you've already learned too many times. But I'm also going to be spending most of the time, as we are celebrating our 10th year uh, of the foundation work, I'm going to be focusing on 10 of the biggest, most important, I'll call them new lessons or I could just call them lessons, but they're, but they're information that came out of our foundation. Now, it, we, can't, we can't invent new things in this business, but I tell you, uh, Chris and Daryl have taken information and put it together in a way that I think really makes a difference in people's understanding of the investment process. So I'll be talking about some of the things they have done, a few of the things that, that, that I have done, and things that I think we have brought to investors that we might have been the first place uh, that you, you tripped across them. So uh, join us. It is free, and uh, there's no sign-up. So you just go at uh, noon on, uh, on Saturday the 17th. That's noon Eastern, by the way. Okay. okay. Enough of that. I, I hope we get uh, some of you j to join us. Today, we've got about six or seven questions that have been submitted. And there's also been some discussions uh, that have come up between the, uh, the three of us that I think are worth discussing here. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, I'd like to start because last week in the podcast, I talked about the difference between the returns of the Vanguard ETFs and the best-in-class ETFs that uh, Chris Pedersen has selected for the people who follow our work. And this year, through the end of August, those differences are huge. And of course, Chris, being the conservative kind of guy he is, said, well, maybe we need to show them a little more to give it a little bit longer term perspective, because in some ways, what's happened this year feels almost too good to be true in terms of, of, of the expectations of the best in class ETF. So, Chris, would you do us a favor and, uh, uh, and, and kind of walk us through your view of the difference between the the, the the Vanguard ETFs and 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 the ETFs that you've selected uh, in the best in class. Sure, uh, the the Vanguard ETFs are, and and you could also look at the Vanguard mutual funds because uh, they're very similar to one another. Uh, they're different from the best in class in a couple of ways. Num number one, they don't tilt as much towards small and as much towards value. They're, uh, and part of that's understandable. You think about Vanguard, they have to um, sell to a very broad market, 
with very large funds, their ability and flexibility to um, to tap these smaller pieces of the market or more value oriented pieces of the market are going to be somewhat constrained by that. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that um, Vanguard follows published indexes, their traditional index mutual fund approach. And that leaves them open to the possibility of other traders in the market anticipating trades that they're going to do and getting in front of those trades so that when it's public knowledge, Vanguard's going to have to move a bunch of money out of one stock and into another stock. That gives people the opportunity to buy the stock that they're going to have to buy before they buy it and then sell it to them at a higher price. And uh, there have been studies done that show that this can add up to tenths of a basis point or even as much as, you know, one to two percent per year, depending on the fund and how public they are about what they're going to do. Um, Avantis, which is uh, not all, but some of our uh, best in class funds, they follow a systematic approach, but they don't follow a published index. They, they have their own proprietary index that's built in house. And so nobody else can anticipate when they're gonna trade or what they're gonna do. And they're patient about how they trade so that they do it in small blocks. And so those two differences should mean that we would see that the best in class funds are a little bit more volatile and have a little bit higher return because of these tilts towards small and value. And they may also have a little bit higher return because of that efficiency in trading and not being front run uh, or not having their trades anticipated by the market. So let me let me just share a window here from uh, Portfolio Visualizer. Okay, yes. so we're looking at uh, the Portfolio <clears throat> Visualizer backtest tool, and this lets you backtest a portfolio or an allocation of stocks and I'm just looking at the um, the month to month so I'm not locking it to a particular year as far back as I can go for four different portfolios this first portfolio is our four fund best in class ETFs so that's a VUS RPV IJR and a VUV 25 percent each the second one are the Vanguard ETFs for the same portfolio and the third one is the Vanguard mutual funds for the same portfolio and uh, I've already analyzed this and you can come down, you can see the allocations, but then you can also see how they've performed. So portfolio one, which is the best in class ETFs, that's this blue one over the history available. And I wish it was longer, but it only goes back to October, 2019. Uh, the best in class portfolio has outperformed by quite a bit. Um, it has, uh, if you started with $10,000 in 2019, you'd have 13699 in in the best in class. You'd have $1,000, almost $1,000 less um, at twelve nine twenty four in Portfolio 2, which was the Vanguard ETFs. And the Vanguard Mutual Funds, which was Portfolio 3, had 13146 So better to look at those maybe in terms of Kager's. And this is where it really is fairly dramatic. Uh, the the best in class have done 11.06, where the other two were 8.93 and 9.55. So, you know, that sounds like great news for best in class. But remember, they tilt more, so there's a little bit more risk. And you can see that back in April of 2020, uh, the best in class portfolio dropped all the way down to $7,000 and uh, $7,005, where the other two portfolios only dropped down to $7,656 and $7,794. So, so you get a little bit higher return, you get a little bit more volatility along the way. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think for a patient buy and hold investor looking to tilt their portfolio towards small in value, that's what you're looking for is, is a little bit higher return, a little bit more volatility. And uh, you can mitigate that with bonds and you can see how to do that in the fine tuning tables we have. So um, yeah, it's been interesting. And Paul, you were saying we've done really well just for the year. I can come up here and go to the start year. I'll change it to year to year and I'll make the start year this year. Mm -hmm. So we'll look just at 2022. And uh, and you can see that 2022 has been tough. 
Um, and in fact, for 2022, um, although Portfolio One, which is the best in class ETFs, have done the best, <laughs> they've all done fairly poorly. Yeah. Uh, so it's about a 9.53% loss on the year for the best in class ETFs versus about 12 to 13% loss for Vanguard, um, depending on whether you're in the mutual funds or the ETFs. And in that earlier uh, grouping, uh, you showed the worst year. Was that the worst calendar year or was that a 12 month period? Uh, when I, let me go back to that month to month and we'll go as far back as we can. Um, I didn't actually show the worst year. I showed the worst drawdown, um, April, 2020. Um, well, look up above in the table. Yes, you can see the worst year. That's right. And the worst year was 10.55% um, negative or, or decline for the best in class versus 14% for the Vanguard ETFs and 13%-ish, 129 for the Vanguard mutual funds. And, and is that a 12-month year or is it a calendar year? I believe that is a 12 month year okay. um, if we come up here to annual returns um, we can see the returns of the portfolios and the worst year is this year so yeah it's a calendar year and it's okay. year to date actually yeah okay well uh the other question that pops out at me is why do you think the difference between the mutual funds uh, at Vanguard and the ETFs at Vanguard? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it may it may be that uh, our mutual funds and our ETFs aren't following exactly the same indices because mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and double check yeah, if, that's okay. if, if they're the same. But it may also be that there's a difference in um, the way ETFs and mutual funds uh, dole out profits. Now that's less so at Vanguard. They treat these as two different funds of the same asset class. So I think it's probably the former. It's probably that these funds aren't exact duplicates of one another. Well, I do know there's a difference in the small cap blend. Uh, we've had a lot of questions. How could we possibly recommend a tax managed small cap blend fund at Vanguard in a, in a tax deferred uh, account? And it's because it's built better in terms of the size of the companies and the, and the, I think even the number of, of, of uh, positions they hold. And there was a difference in those in, in those two indexes or whatever they would be called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I think that's probably what it is. Yep. That's great. I, 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 do, I do appreciate that a lot. I think that's uh, uh, another good lesson on por portfolio visualizer. Um, and and uh, Daryl, I've got, I've got one uh, here for you. I, every time I see the word quilt chart popping out of an email, I know this is something probably going to have to do with you. But um, uh, Mike says, hi, team. Thank you so much for all your work. I'm using your advice extensively. I'm looking at the four fund portfolio. I was wondering why you include small cap blend. I notice on your quilt charts that small cap blend is almost never better than small cap value. I also have read in several places that small cap growth is an asset class to avoid. Wouldn't it be better and simpler to make this a three fund portfolio with large cap blend, large cap value, and small cap value? So what, what say you, director of analytics? Well, um... I think that we should probably look at a few charts I put together. I'm I'm an engineer, so I do charts, right? So here's the quilt chart for the 92 years, I guess it is. 
from 28 to 2019. And what I've done on this quilt chart is box the small cap blend fund, their asset class. And mm. it's kind of this orangish, pinkish kind of color. And small cap value is the blue or cyan color. And I boxed the small cap blend every year that it did better than small cap value. And you can see there's a lot. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that it's almost never better than small cap value. Uh, in fact, when you actually go look at this and run the numbers, it's almost half and half. Small cap blend does better than small cap value about 47% of the time in this particular 92 year period. So it's not, it's not that simple. It's not, it's not what, uh, what was said. Um, if you go and but, you look- Well, Daryl, just, just to check you on that. Um, what was said is that small cap growth is an asset class to be avoided. And since small cap well, lens kind of a yes. neighbor, I think he was he was doing a little guilt by association, right? He did um, say small cap bend was one to small cap growth was one to avoid, but he also said small cap blend never does almost never does better than small agreed. Cap value. Agreed, yeah, yeah. And that's not true. And yep. so um when you look at look at this and you look at the the frequency of it uh to to toss it out because it's almost never better. Um is is a is not is not true and then you're right he made the false equivalently that small cap blend is mostly small cap growth and i don't i think what you're saying is that that is not necessarily true is that did i hear well, you if right it's, if it's cap weighted uh then it would not be surprising to see that that the majority of the holdings of small cap blend would be more growth oriented, but probably part of it is, and, and, and there's another table that you have that shows how often the S&P 500 uh, is at the top and small cap value is at the bottom uh, of, of all of these asset classes. But, but when growth is doing well, then it would not be... Um, unusual that's that small cap blend which includes the growth would do better than small cap value and i think it's also likely without having looked at every year that because when small cap value goes down it's probably uh, going to go down more than small cap blend not always but probably and so a lot of those years that small cap blend beat small cap value, and we could go back and look at that, look at that table, probably a lot of those were when the market was not doing well. Now that's that's intuitive, Daryl, but maybe that's maybe that and maybe it's not right. <laughs> there we go. So yes, and I mean, in a lot of those cases, you can see at the very bottom of the list of, of the column is small cap value, and right above it is uh, is small cap blend, and that little bit of growth yeah. uh, helped give it a slightly better return. Although what you'll notice, not a big difference, not a big difference between the small cap blend and the small cap value when they're both losing money, but but that may be part of the story. Yeah, I think when you look at the at the uh, table that I put together here where it shows it's a ranking, the ordinal ranking versus the asset class ranking and, and it, it, the it, those on the podcast or on the on the audio won't be able to see this. So we'll talk about it a little bit here. Yeah. But <clears throat> a small cap value is the top performing was the top performing asset class during those 92 years 37 percent of the time and uh the other the, then as you go down uh in in rank it was the second best 16 percent of the time so that's 40 what 53 percent of the time small cap blend was the best 
18% of the time and the second best 30% of the time. So that's 48% of the time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, a lot of the time when those two are duking it out for who's better and who's worse. And sometimes the small part wins and sometimes the value part wins. Um, well, and, and is it fair? Uh, there's the, the sound investing equity portfolio ordinal ranking summary. Do you have that close by, by chance? If you don't, that's okay. I'll just give you some numbers. There this, we one you're, this one you're talking about? Yeah. For people who are trying to figure out ways to mix and match these, these asset classes, um, as I thought about it, this fellow is, is, gentleman is talking about the S&P 500 and the all value, putting together the S&P 500 and the all value portfolio. Now, now the U.S. all value portfolio compounded at 12.5 and the S&P at 10.2. Now, I realize this is not exact in terms of the re impact of rebalancing, but in essence, if I had two thirds in the all value and one third in the S&P 500, that would give me about an 11.7% compound rate of return. So uh, that would make it a productive portfolio, but not as productive as the four fund or the two fund or the all value or certainly the small cap value. So I'm not sure that doing what he's suggesting is, is, is going to be helpful in terms of, of returns. Does that make sense? It, it yeah. does. Um, yeah, go there's. Ahead, go ahead, Daryl. No, I was I was going to say, yeah, I, I agree with you, Paul. So now we'll see if I agree with you, Chris. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, you know, this information about small cap growth being an asset or a part of the market that doesn't perform particularly well is is not a secret. It's well known to the people who create and manage these funds. And one of the simple things you can do to avoid the, the worst part of that corner of the market is just filter on companies that show a profit, any profit. Because the ones that are the most dangerous are the ones that everybody's super excited about, that they're gonna make a lot of money someday because they told a fantastic story to their investors and their valuations are sky high. So if you just screen on profitability, and uh, I think S&P does that, for example. If you just screen on profitability, you get significantly better returns in even in that corner of the, the universe of stocks. So depending on how you define small cap blend, if you have a screen for profitability, you may be avoiding a lot of that trouble down there. Um, some small cap blends actually filter out a certain amount of growth too. So. In practice, um, including small cap blend, I think gives you regret avoidance because you have this one more way to win, right? When small cap blend does well, you take part in it. And it's very unlikely to really hurt your performance very much as long as you choose good funds. So Chris, do you know when you're looking at ETFs, whether uh, and small cap blend, do you have, uh, do, do you take that into consideration, the profitability factor? I do. It, well, and, and I take into consideration how much small crafts, how much of the small cap growth universe they include. My preference would be a fund that um, is shifted a little bit left so that it's a small cap blend fund that gives you some additional exposure to small cap value and maybe a little bit of exposure to small cap growth. If one was shifted to the right and it was heavy on small cap growth and didn't give any exposure to small cap value, um, that would be a red flag for me. Yeah. So would it be likely that if you use that profitability filter, that the average size company is going to be a little bigger? Uh, possibly, but it depends on the rest of the fund construction rules because there are things you can do to, to offset that as well. Yeah. Okay. Daryl, before we leave this table, anything else you want to add? No, I okay. agree with Chris, by the way. 
So that's great. I agree with you, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> we'll 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 keep our battles for later. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> battles. Do we have so, battles? <laughs> so so Chris, since we're talking about the multi-factor, the factors. Uh, one of our followers said, please consider doing a podcast on multi-factor and then in parens, DFA and Avantis. By the way, I've heard a lot of people say Avantis. And uh, if you know what it is, you can certainly correct me, but nobody's corrected me when I say Avantis. Um, but the multi-factor of those fund families versus the single factor uh, as we have in the uh, RZV, that's uh, the pure value fund. Um, this person said it would be a, a good investor education. Well, let's see if we can help Grant and, uh, and, and, and some more of our listeners. What would you have to say uh, about them? the multi-factor versus the single factor funds? I, I think my starting place for answering this question is uh, that, that a, an S&P 500 fund is a single factor. It gives you exposure to the market risk factor. A value fund gives you exposure to two factors because it's got market risk and value. A small cap value fund gives you exposure to three factors because you've got market risk, size risk, and value risk. So there's a lot of funds in our portfolio that are already multi-factor funds. But within the industry, there are a number of funds that are named multi-factor funds. And if you read Larry Swedro's book, he'll tell you that when you combine multiple factors, you get a, a uh, reduced probability of disappointment. That's the way I like to think of it. Because uh, when one factor's working and the others aren't, you're more likely to still get some return. You're, you, you get uh, more consistency through the diversification across the factors. So far, so good. Um, the problem I have is that not all of the factors are equally available and not all of the factors are equally powerful and not all of the factors are equally efficient. And so when you look at funds within the industry that are named multi-factor funds, they tend to combine not just size and value and market risk, but they also throw in maybe momentum or low volatility or, um, or profitability. And the harder you try to get all of these harder to get uh, factors, if you will, um, the less efficient it is. Great. Chris, thank you very much. Um, here's one I, I, I think you'll like, Daryl. Uh, question is, if small cap value should make more than small cap blend, what about using micro cap value for even better returns? What do you got on that? Well, I'm, I'm kind of an analytical person. So, you know, I think that sounds like it might be a good idea. But I also think that there are some problems with it. And uh, I'm sure Chris will, will help me if I'm wrong about that. But I think that micro cap value would be a very small asset class. I don't, I suspect there are not very many uh, companies that would be in that class and they would be hard to find uh, and construct a, an index that you would want to use for them uh, and then to or to define that index and then to construct it and maintain it would be an expensive thing to do. Um, plus, I haven't found a lot of data. Uh, if any, on micro cap value as an asset class that covers anything close to a reasonable period of time. So <clears throat> what about the blend, micro cap blend? Is that easier? Well, yeah. So that's what I did. I said, well, let's take a look at how small versus micro plays out in the blend category. And so, uh, so that's what I did. Let me share here. These, this is data from uh, DFA's Returns Web database, and it goes back uh, 94 years. 
I think it's June of 27 through July of 2022, 1927 to July of 2022. And uh, this has been, this is the, the bins of the annual returns. And so the, the height of this middle bin here is, this is the, the bottom of the second quartile of returns. And then this is the top of the second quart uh, third quartile the bar in here is uh, the average, I believe, and the X is the median, or it's the other way around. I'm not sure right now. I apologize for that. But, and then these, uh, the tops of these whiskers, as Craig calls them, are the, the top and bottom of the, of the fourth and first quartile, respectively. These dots are outliers. And so when you look at this and you look at small cap blend, and I apologize for the order here, but if you look at this small cap blend here and the small cap, I'm sorry, micro cap blend here, small cap blend here, and you go down and you look below at the data, you can see that it, it doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, for example, the median return, median annual return for micro cap blend uh, over this 94 year period was 18.5. And the median return for small cap blend was 18.1. Uh, and the averages were 16.25 and 15.25 respectively. So yeah, there's a little bit of an effect there. Um, not sure that it's much. Um, when you look at the top of the third quartile, in other words, the the... 75% of the returns are less than this. The small cap blend is 34.6 and small, I'm sorry, micro cap blend is 34.6 and small cap blend is 34.1 or 34.0 actually. So, and then the bottom of the second quartile is minus 11, minus 5.1 and minus 3.7 for micro cap and small cap blend respectively. When you look at visually at how these stack up against each other, they're really pretty similar. The only really difference is, uh, major difference, is that uh, in the micro cap blend, your, your 25th percentile of returns is about a percent and what is that? Seven to a percent, 1.4% difference for the the bottom of the second quartile or the 25th percentile of the, of the returns. So they're similar in the blend in, to when I look at these numbers, they're similar. The, the differences are in the noise, I think, um, for the most part. And, and it may be, by the way, Daryl, that, and, and Chris, you might weigh in on this, the cost of managing uh, a micro cap portfolio uh, could be a lot higher uh, than managing a small cap blend portfolio, um, not just in terms of what you pay people to do it, um, but but also in the the cost of turnover yeah. uh, and the trading costs, the the spread between the bid and ask and all those things that end up coming out of your pocket eventually uh, could be a great deal higher with the micro cap than the small cap blend. Yeah, and I should point out, Paul, that's a good point. These data here are, uh, are for index values, so they don't include an expense ratio. Yeah. So, and that's what you're talking about, really. Yeah. Um, and so those would, I believe you're right, that the impact would be more on the micro cap than the small cap. Well, that's 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 great, and and uh, and and here's I don't know whose wheelhouse this one is in, but the question comes from one of our followers, listeners. He, they ask, how much more risky is large cap value than the S and P five hundred? Who wants to weigh in on that one? I've done a little work on it, and I'm sure Chris okay. can, can weigh on this <laughs> okay. also. Um, but you know, it depends a little bit on on how you define risk. You know, there are multiple kinds of risk. You know, you can think about it in terms of standard deviation or drawdown 
or volatility or um, you know the risk of not making what you need to make in order to get what you want to have when you need it. Uh, so risk of growth, if you will. Um, there's there's risk per unit of return um, or downside risk, like the, in the Sortino ratio. So I've, I've taken a look at some of those and it's very cursory, um, but uh, we can we can take a look at it and, and I would express, expect Chris to chime in on this too. Um, so when I look at the returns for uh, the large cap value index and the S&P 500 index as extracted from the DFA returns web uh, database, you can look at uh, volatility, growth, and drawdown, for example. And um, on this chart, for those on the video, the I've, I've got the, the large cap value index and the S&P 500 index and comparing them uh, to each other, the winner is, or the winner, the one that did better or had less risk uh, in a given category of, of risk is boxed in blue and uh, the one that did not do as well is boxed in red. So if you look at volatility and you think of it in terms of standard deviation, you would expect that the, the large cap value would have more, more volatility. And in fact, it does over this 90, I don't know how long this is, 95 year period. Um, and, and so, so yes, it's a little more volatile. If volatility is something that's likely to make you decide that you've gone down the wrong path and it's time to get out, that's probably not a good thing to, to have. Um, is the difference between a standard devi annual standard deviation of 21.8 versus 18.7 a lot? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think that's much difference in volatility, really. So what about the risk of your assets not growing to what you need? And so uh, this is the, the, I think this is probably, I don't remember what this is the growth of. I think it might be the growth of, this is only over 95 years. So this might be the growth of $1. I'm not sure. I apologize for that. But uh, the small cap value index, uh, the ending value of the growth of wealth curve is 22,800 roughly. And the S&P 500 growth over the same period is about 9,800. So if you think of risk in terms of being able to meet your goals, uh, then the large cap value index is probably less risky in terms of uh, being able to meet those goals than the small cap, I'm sorry, than the S&P 500 index is. If you're concerned about drawdowns, um, then you can look at the lowest one year return over this 95 year period. And uh, you can see that the large cap value index was down uh, by almost, by a little more than 78% in one year. It was uh, July of 31 through June of 32. And over the same period of time, the S&P 500 index was down 68%. So it was down a little less about 10, a little more than 10% less than the, uh, than the large cap value is down. Is large cap value riskier? I guess it depends on what you think of as, as risk. Um, the one thing I wish I had done here that I didn't do was, was go through and look at the month to month uh, drawdowns like a fine, in our fine tuning table and also to calculate the Sharp and Sortino ratios. I, I didn't have a chance to get to that yet. Those are other things that would be interesting to look at, but so it doesn't go back as far. But you can you can actually do that pretty easily at Portfolio Visualizer yes. and go back to 1972, and uh, and what you'll find if you do that is that the the volatility as you step away from the total market, the volatility does go up. So as you go from total market or S&P 500, which is very close to total market, to large right. value or to small blend or to small value, the farther you go away from the total market, the more the volatility goes up. But at the same time, the, diverse, the meaningful diversification goes up and the return per unit of risk goes up and the return uh, other measures of risk like safe withdrawal rate go up. 
So it's, it, you know, to, to Daryl's point, it really de depends on how you define risk. Um, if what you care about is entirely volatility, you just want the smoothest possible ride, and you're not willing to diversify with bonds to get it, then the total market's probably a safe bet. Plus it's gonna have zero tracking error. But if you're willing to diversify with bonds, the smoothest possible ride is actually gonna be small cap value with a lot of bonds. That's actually gonna be the smoothest possible ride for the highest return. That's, that's a Larry Barbell portfolio, right? And, it's, and the reason is that it's the most meaningfully diversified yes. because you have exposure to all of the, the different attributes of bonds and fixed income and all of the different, different attributes of the stock market and the small part and the value part. And you mix it all together and it's, it's a really well diversified mix. Right. I, I would agree with that. Most of these risks, that whenever you'd have a risk discussion, everybody immediately knows what they mean by risk and they talk about it from their perspective. <laughs> they don't ever, in my experience, most of the time, they don't ever actually sit down and say, well, what do you mean when you say risk? Right. And uh, the default assumption is standard deviation. And I actually think that's a poor a poor use of, uh, uh, or a poor thing to use for risk. And another question, talking about risk and how we had, how we internalize it and we think about it and we put numbers to it in our mind. Uh, I, I was thinking about, Chris, you've got a position from something you've held for some time that went very high. You've talked about it in the past. And then it went down. Now, you could have sold it when it was very high, but your position was, I'm in it for the long term. And what I would like to have you discuss, because I've always found you so grounded in this thought process of how you think about your investments, and I'll have a question for you as well, Daryl. But when you look at that that company that stock and you could have gotten out at some big number, but now it's a lower number, significantly lower number, what does that high number mean to you? Does it have any relevance to the future at all? Because, and the reason I ask is so often I hear from people, if that stock ever gets back up to where it was, I'm getting out. But emotionally how do you think that relationship between what you could have had and then what you will have at some point uh we, we know that many stocks never hit their their historical high again and then many just blow right through it i think of amazon going from what a hundred and something down to seventeen dollars and then over a thousand so how do you think that through? Well, I, you know, at an objective intellectual level, I know that it's worth what it's worth today, right? Mm -hmm. the, the market tells you what it's worth. And uh, as one of my wise CEOs used to say, uh, the, the, stock, the stock price isn't what you're worth. It's just the grade. It's just the grade you got today right it's uh, the the worth of the company is the earnings it generates and the and the growth in those earnings and the goodness that it does in the world and all of these other things and uh so uh, you know i still feel very comfortable about the uh, investments we hold because i know they all they all have intrinsic value you know they're 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 able to generate good earnings and produce value in the world and they're likely to continue to do that in the future because their their leadership is good and uh and the vast majority of what we hold is is in the index funds and in and invested the way we advocate people but um just various historical things have left me with what what at times has been an uncomfortably large portion of our portfolio and today is a more manageable portion of our yeah. portfolio. <laughs> so, you know, what sometimes happened? these... Wow, yeah, let's turn that big ear into a silk purse. <laughs> yeah, sometimes these things self-rebalance. Um, 
I, I did something though that I think is worth sharing with your listeners because uh, there there was a particularly bad day recently when it seemed like the world conspired against this particular holding and it dropped a lot. And I actually, I keep a daily deliberate diary uh, where I kind of score how I did on the previous day and think about ways to improve. And uh, I actually criticized my, said, myself. I said, you're letting today's market influence your mood. You shouldn't do that. And then in my plan for the day, I said, um, you know, put the market ups and downs in contest. Chris, this is what the market does. It's not the end of the world. Um, you know, the companies you're invested in still have their founders in place. They have many sound businesses to drive future earnings. The current downturn is partly driven by policy decisions and things outside their control that are likely short term. You know, they're driven by economic things that are likely short term you know, these things will pass. Uh, You have a lot of other investments, you're diversified, you know, kind of (laughs) chill. And then I said, (laughs) you know, there's nothing you can do about this. Market ups and downs happen. So think about the things you can do something about. You can get things done for Merriman listeners, you can read books and learn new things, you can connect with friends over lunch, you can do something nice for those friends, you can do your physical therapy, which is good for my back. You know, you can do your exercises, you can enjoy the beautiful day, you can listen to your daughter and your wife who are living with you, you know, do those, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So, you know, even even we who kind of work sort of in the industry and living this every day, sometimes need a pep talk. That was my pep talk to myself. And I felt so much more relaxed after I did that because it just put it all in context. It was like, yeah, do the stuff you can do. Yeah, that's great. That, Daryl, what would uh, do, do you have a, 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 a set of thoughts that you go through as these markets go up and down and sometimes down more than you're comfortable and and sometimes up more than you could have ever believed? Um, you know, I guess I've I've reached the point to where I'm I'm pretty chill about these kind of things. Like Chris says, I've I have had uh, a task I do every Saturday morning. Sometimes it's not until Sunday or even Monday morning, but every weekend for the last fifteen years or so, and that's to go through and accumulate. I don't use one of these aggregator things. I want to do it myself. I go through and I I find out what the value of closing value of all my accounts were. I don't act. I don't even look at the funds inside anymore. I may have at one time or another, but I look at the account as an aggregate, and they're all invested a, li- a little bit differently. But um, for the most part, it's it's index funds. It's all index funds, and uh, but I've been doing this for so long, and I've kept track of of the top three worst days and the top three best days. Oh. And I plot it on a graph, of course, I'm an engineer. So I plot things on a graph and I go back and I look at it. And when I have a bad day or a bad week in my case, I notice that the graph moved about that much. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, oh, well, okay. You know, that's not a big deal. How far back would I have had to have gone on the graph to where the total portfolio value would be what it is today. You know, sometimes it's not very far, you know, (laughs) it's pretty bad when it's gone down quite a bit, you know, most of the time now, you know, all you need to do is go back a couple of years and you're there. So when it went down in in the pandemic crash, but uh, so I don't, I don't worry about a lot of those things uh, as much. And, and I think, Part of that is because of my age and stage of life, as as my mother would say. But um, the other, but the thing I think that you can try to think about when you have these these kind of feelings is to go go back and review your investment policy statement. What did you say in there about what you do when you have a bear market or when you have a bad day or a bad week? Um, what when you were when you were much in a much calmer frame of mind and you were thinking about your your portfolio and how you were going to manage your investments what did you write down as your policy to do when 
the market goes down more than you're comfortable with. Um, I like Chris's idea. Um, I think you should you should write that list up, Chris, and, <laughs> and we can we can put it somewhere where where people can go look at it. You know, because it's sometimes it's kind of helpful to think about those things. You don't you don't think about them when you're in the midst of a of a emotionally charged state. Um, I, I think one of the hardest things for all of us, though, is that we do we're human. We're still human. We still have a point at which we will capitulate. And uh, the, I can't tell you what that is for me, uh, but I, I know that I'm still human. Uh, when, yeah. you know, when I was a Hewlett Packard employee, I think the stock went from about 130 down to 10 before I capitulated, you know, and I sold. And I'd like to think I'd do better now <laughs> that I'd write it all the way down to five or two or one. Um, well, if it's gone from one, what's if that? It's gone from one thirty to ten. How much more do you have to lose? <laughs> yeah, by writing I, it out exactly. And, you know? and had I had I written it out, I would have done better. So there is a life lesson in that. But but I think we're all still human. There's still a place at which we will capitulate, and that's why it's really important to right size our risks and to have a diversified portfolio where we have enough fixed income in there that that uh, it's going to soften those blows to the point that we that it that it will stay within that risk profile that's one of the things i found interesting in the spreadsheet is where i keep track of the top three or maybe it's five now uh best weeks and worst weeks and when i when i rack this up at the end of the end of the week and I look at it and go, wow, I was down that much this week. And then I go over and look at what the worst down weeks were over the last however long it's been, 10, 15 years. And I say, oh, well, that's not so bad then. Yeah. I, I live through that. Way I can live through this, you know. <laughs> well, what is what was interesting being an advisor was listening to how people internalized loss. It was not uncommon because most of the clients were, there were couples and it was not uncommon that one really liked the investment process and the other one didn't. And the way they responded to the bad times was they said, we could have paid off all of our debt if we had that money back. We could have gone on a trip if we had that money back. They, they, they won an opportunity, in a sense, to emotionally relive it and fix it. And I think one of the challenges of being a great investor for a lifetime is understanding that you, you can't fix it. I mean, we know we, we, none of us is going to do something we think is stupid, even though oftentimes we do things that are stupid. We don't think they're stupid when we do them. And, um, and, and, and probably in terms of helping people do better, if we had a way to help them understand when they've really done something that is not likely to produce a good return over the long term. And, and, uh, and I think that's a lot of what our work is about is trying to get people on a straight and narrow that is likely not to be straight and narrow. It will be, it will be hopefully up for the long term, but never straight. So uh, you guys, I think, are doing a lot to help people think through this. We have overstayed our welcome with our, <laughs> with our listeners today. Uh, thank you both so very much. I, I hope folks will be able to come out and, and, and join us at uh, uh, join me at, with the Bogleheads on the 17th. And uh, thanks for all you two do to, to, to help our investors do better. You guys have uh, a great rest of this summer and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully see you soon. Thanks, thanks Paul. Thanks, Paul. Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.